were embarking upon. So yeah, he did violate. He did enter six. He said there were more circles, but because of him, we have these sketches, and because of him, um, people say, oh, there were there were no more than six hundred, and I, I disagree with that because he, as an architect and as a um, engineer, he was you know, very prominent in the city. He wrote this detailed narrative and said five to six hundred. And they say, you know, he had it accurately, but he also saw it in February, which could be one of the coldest months of the year, when people were poorly clad, many times no shoes, right, walking the distance to get there. Um, sometimes at night. So uh, there are other people who said into the thousands, and I, I accept them <laughs> because I know it in summer times and spring times there would have been more than there would have been in February. So. Um, but he saw some important stuff. He, he, he made the sketch of the banza. We know it's a forerunner of the banjo. Uh, and then he sketched the drums. You see this man straddled the, straddling the drum. Very, very important because we see that throughout the African diaspora. And that helps us connect these cultural practices. It helps us connect people. And so um, I have a, a video that we're going to see really soon of the man straddling the drum playing. In Haiti. Because Alan Lomax, who was one of the coordinators or interviewers during the WPA, not only interviewed people here, but he also went to Haiti and, interviewed, and made videos as well. And, and hopefully we'll hear some audio that he recorded in Louisiana, again, of the woman singing songs that she that she heard. In, uh, she said the songs of the Congo Square. I'm not sure she heard them in Congo Square. But I sent this, these sketches to an ethnomusicologist who is from the Congo. And he said, all of these are familiar to me from my home. He said, even the drum that looks like a school. And I said, oh, that's a drum. You hit it like this, you hold it. He says, no, that is a drum. That a person sits on, the drummer sits on the ground. Remember I said those circles had musicians. Each circle had his own musician, the orchestra, so to speak. And this drummer would sit on the ground, put his the toe underneath to touch the head of the drum from underneath, play with his hand, but move the toe back and forth. What would that do to the pitch when you move your toe back and forth? All to the pitch. So you're gonna see the same concept on the video that I'll show you because you see this foot that's very, very close to the head? That's no incident that he put that heel so close to the head of the drum because the drummer who straddles the drum like this uses the heel of the, of the foot against the head of the drum. So as he plays with his hand, he moves the heel back and forth to do what? Same Onto the pitch. And um, the drum that is made on this style is played is very, very long. So mm -hmm. usually someone sits at the back and plays uh, the drum at the back as well. All right. I just interviewed, and we're going to talk about my interviews. Oh, I need a lot. Uh, to um, just interview someone from, from Martinique who is a musician. And when I first met her, I met her in Congo Square with a drummer friend. And she was sitting at the back playing the drum as he, uh, his name is Boas, was sitting at the top, uh, sitting up front drumming with his foot. So let's look at this real quick. Well, it's just one more. Yes. On the left hand side, that instrument um, is a precursor of the, of the banjo, yes. but it's also a derivation of the Senegalese quarter. Yes. yes. So it is the child of the quarter, but the parent of the American banjo. And also, 1819 is important. In the previous uh, <coughs> illustration, you have 1808. That is at the dawn of the uh, domestic trade. And you see descriptions of more Africanized instruments. But as you move to 1834, as you identify, you see these derivations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 1819 is in between. Right. And you still see more authentic African instruments there. And after, around this time period, James Creasy, you know, after 1808, we hear songs like Carry Me Back to Old Virginia, recorded. This mm. is a newspaper article. This is what they were singing. Um, hey, you yellow gal, things like that. Uh, so so we can definitely see the the transition, the migration, the changes. When I, when I think about it, Congo Square's history is really a history of the wars. Because if you do the timelines, and I have a timeline in one of my books, you can really see the, the um, changes in administration. Let me talk a little bit more about that. Um, 
we hear often that every Sunday they were out there in Congo Square meeting the enslaved people. They were not out there every Sunday because if there was an administration change, if there was an, a rumor of an uprising, not just an uprising, just the rumor of it, you know, the dances were in jeopardy of being shut down, and many times they were shut down. So that is one myth that was not true. We can see it, again, in the timelines. We can see it in, in, um, in the occurrence of events in the city. Okay. You mentioned something else, 1819. So this is two years after the ordinance that regulated all of these uh, gatherings to one location. Remember I said Congo Square was not the only location? It was not the first location. You heard about the King's Plantation. But uh, enslaved people gathered from the beginning of the city. At, on the levees, backyards, open squares, different places around the city. 